Hey everybody, KMO here with uh, another take on my my dissatisfaction with how I've spent the uh, the last decade and a half in terms of uh, the things that I allowed myself to be obsessed by. Um, I was talking about peak oil and how I've done hundreds of interviews on the topic of peak oil over the years and how I really let it um, color my thinking and color my perspective, particularly in the crucial year of 2008. I know a lot of you weren't really paying attention to, uh, you know, grown-up stuff in 2008, and for others of you, that seems like yesterday. But in July of 2008, the price of oil spiked to $127.77. And I remember reading in various places in the, the peak oil blogosphere that, you know, this was not a spike, that this was the new price and that it would not be going down, that that's, you know, this was proof that the uh, the oil constraints were starting to clamp down and that the U.S. economy would soon fall. Now, we all know that later that year, uh, things went really haywire in, in the finance sector. So it really seemed to those of us in the peak oil sphere that, uh, yeah, that was right. This wasn't a price spike. This was a jump in price that would be a new pressure going forward and that there would be no relief from that pressure. And I remember talking to my uncle about this at the time, and my uncle, who lives in Arkansas and is a cattle farmer, you know, when I gave him the, um, the peak oil line about how this isn't a spike, this is the new, you know, the new floor for the price of oil, he said, no, it's a speculative bubble, it'll go back down. Well, who was right? Was it the peak oil aficionados or was it my cattle farmer uncle in Arkansas? Well, Oil prices hit a low for that year in December when they went down to $35 and change per barrel. So clearly my cattle farmer uncle in Arkansas was correct. And the, and the Post Carbon Institute and uh, all of the, the various people who were the big names in the peak oil scene at the time were all absolutely full on, no holds barred, no wiggle room, wrong. They were simply wrong about what was happening. But I didn't see it. And what's more, the financial crisis uh, made all of the, the heaviest doomsaying prophecies in the world seem really legit. And now that I think about it, the really sleazy actors in this whole affair are the ones who pair peak oil or you know something else, maybe uh, financial volatility or problems with fiat currency or something. They, they identify some trend which they can extrapolate out into disaster and then they say the, the solution for you is to buy my investment product, to buy gold, to you know buy shares in this program or that. Basically to spend money on a product or service that I am offering in order to alleviate your anxiety over the coming collapse. Anxiety which I tapped into and helped amplify. That is sleazy. So I want to absolutely distance myself from anything along those lines. I, I got taken and at the same time I reinforced, I amped up that peak oil paranoia because it served my psychological purposes. But I definitely preached that message to a lot of people. And uh, a lot of them took it very seriously. And I expect that, like me, a lot of them paid a heavy price for it. You know, various people have written to me to say, yeah, things didn't work out like the, the peak oil doomers said they would. But at the same time, it's really useful to know about energy, you know, the history of energy use and the role that fossil fuel energy plays in powering the, the infrastructure of our technological civilization and how dependent we are on it and how, you know, how dense an energy source it is, how that solar and wind and tidal and all the other forms of alternative energy or green energy just don't come anywhere close to providing the same energy density, you know, the same energy returned on energy invested as fossil fuels do. And they never will. They simply can't. And what's more, you know, none of these so-called green energies have done anything at all to replace fossil fuel energy. They have only added on to what we, our civilization is deriving from fossil fuel energy. So the idea that, you know, eventually we're going to shift over to uh, all renewable resources and power our civilization at the same level that we do now, absolute fantasy. And, you know, if you study peak oil, that will become apparent to you. But at the same time, that's a 
big picture look at where technological civilization is going. And if you were to make your own personal life decisions based on that map pulled out to that level, that would be like trying to drive to the store without looking through the windshield, but only looking at a road atlas or, you know, a, a map of the highway system of your country. You know, to make short trips, to navigate on a human scale, you don't keep your eyes glued to that big picture map. You have to look through and be responsive to what you see in your windshield. And that's what I failed to do, absolutely failed to do, in my response to this whole peak oil agenda. And as I say, what I missed in letting this subject capture my attention to the degree that it did and, and subscribing to the mania, which was just routine in that community, was that I did not see, you know, I'm, I'm shooting this on a cell phone. I will edit this video on a phone. I will upload to YouTube from a phone. And thanks to your feedback, I will correct the volume levels before I upload. Um, all of this, basically, I am doing what would have cost it would have taken thousands of dollars worth of video and audio equipment and, you know, a computer, a freestanding computer or some sort of editing bay. You know, it's all on a phone now. And I was aware of Moore's Law at the time. I was aware of the, you know, the increasing returns on you know, the power of the computer hardware. I understood, you know, we were progressing toward uh, more sophisticated software into what could genuinely be considered artificial intelligence. And I think we're just now starting to cross that threshold. Uh, I've, I've had people say that, you know, artificial intelligence is a misnomer. There's no such thing. And, you know, fine. I, I have no no pushback against that other than just, hey, that's that's the common phrase. I mean, that's the terminology we're using. If you have an issue with it, you know, I can sympathize. But still, uh, I, I think that that horse is, is bolted from the bar and there is no putting it back. But on the topic of um, artificial intelligence and peak oil, uh, I want to read some feedback that I've gotten from two people who I have known for a very long time. One who has been a very long time generous supporter of my work in the sea realm and who's definitely taken a, a long interest in peak oil. And the other is somebody who has been a guest on the program, but uh, really he's, he's a friend of mine from my college days. And he's a very creative individual, you know, not, not an analyst of any sort, very much a comedian and an author. He writes and illustrates children's books. Um, but he posted something to Twitter the other day about AI. So I want to just share these both with you because I think they make a nice contrast about um, navigating into an uncertain future. So first from the person that I described as being a longtime friend and supporter of the Sea Realm. Uh, I will identify him only as Bruce, but uh, Bruce is an animator. He's worked on some uh, really classic uh, animated films, you know, classic for people of my generation and my, my demographic, like some of the films of Ralph Bakshi, uh, he worked on those. But he writes, Hi, KMO. Your recent podcast, Sea Realm Vault number 323, served as a happy coincidence. The opportunity to look back on the preceding dozen years or so, having just finished reading Mateo Azuneu's, sorry about the pronunciation, Oil, Power, and War, A Dark History, the Post Carbon Institute's translation of the French original, with a foreword by Richard Heinberg, and an afterword by the author, who brings the story up to date as of April 2018. I found myself asking, why should I bother with this stuff in so much detail at this late date? When, in fact, the world seems to have bounced along quite nicely, thank you, absorbing shocks, the housing crisis, financial bubble, the election of Trump, never-ending wars, etc., evolving and integrating new tech, boosting oil and gas extraction totals to new heights. Still, there is some value to be had in noting the history of the oil age and the way the long emergency has played out and continues to do so. Whether it commands one's interests or not is another matter. I don't happen to share your fascination with the continuing emergence of AI, which I think is a misnomer, and I don't believe that much has been missed by not following it more closely. It strikes me as a shiny object, a distraction, not only for the study of natural systems, but from the real Internet of Things as well. That is, the behavior of people, interacting in ways that are largely prescribed by the structure of the net that enables it. AI, as a topic, doesn't add clarity for me. It contributes more noise to the signal. 
In my view, we are building a rather large and complex mirroring device, an additional room in the echo chamber, and I'm not at all certain how useful that will prove to be. It will, however, certainly be energy intensive, and the infrastructure and business models that have already been put in place have sequestered a great deal of wealth and power. That's worth commenting on. McLuhan, without having any experience with the internet, foresaw our era as a global village. Those of us who live in the small towns know that the content of village conversation is largely phatic gossip. But what he did not foresee was that the lords and ladies of the manor would live at the top of the hill in palaces of extreme opulence, while immiserating the peasants in the fields below, who accept this transfer of wealth as a fact of life, because it's a system that offers order and convenience. That said, the problem for me what that said, the problem for me with trying to maintain an interest in the peak oil topic is that it provided little or no help in trying to determine what was to be done about it. Though we've passed the point of peak of conventional oil extraction, turns out at roughly the same time you started the podcast, the whole motivation to follow the topic seemed to stem from trying to determine how fast the crash would happen, scanning the horizon for what we thought would constitute the first signs of collapse. Heinberg himself, this is uh, Richard Heinberg of the Post Carbon Institute, Heinberg himself recently reviewed that period, noting that we noting that what we all missed was the enormous momentum of extend and pretend, and the way in which this translated into the financialization of the economy, using the fumes of debt as fuel for the engine. We're still working that out, but what to do in the meantime? He also points to the rapid onset of the repercussions of climate change, and that's largely where I think peak oil has taken refuge, lurking behind a curtain of related potentially catastrophic concerns. So I'm going to skip a paragraph and go on to his, his penultimate paragraph where he writes, Still, the question remains, what do you do with the time that's left to continue being productive, to head in some useful direction without having even a flawed map for the future available? Really, the only information we have to go on is the history of our choices to date, personal and collective. Is the trend toward a more centralized, energy-intensive, neural social network or towards a downsized, community-based, face-to-face system of production, exchange, and support. I choose both. I'm currently frying my DNA inside 5G Wi-Fi service in the wilds of rural Colorado, without any assurance as to what the consequences might be. However, our president's quest to make America dominant in energy has the potential to directly affect my water supply, since I live down watershed from BLM public lands ripe for oil and gas leasing and fracking. So that still matters. And I wanted to contrast this with uh, a tweet by my friend Paul. Paul tweeted, I feel like we're nearing a time when we will hand some aspects of our lives over to AI. Not our current digital servants and not annoying messages. Personalities that we love. Ones that can motivate, cajole, and pout to get us to live our best lives. It will be very dangerous. And I I very much resonate with what Paul has written here. Um, I've left his full name on screen there, and you can see his Twitter handle. If you want to go and follow him, he he posts like a madman on Twitter. He uh, is quite the volume poster. If if you do follow him because you 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 found out about him on this video, please be nice. (laughs) He's a friend of mine, and uh, I just don't want to bring him. (sighs) He's quit Twitter before because things got ugly. So... Don't let things get ugly. Don't be ugly, at least not with my friends. I think I'm probably nearing the end of, uh, you know, a, a video segment here. But I read recently, or I guess I listened to the audiobook, which is def- definitely not reading. But I listened, I took in the content of uh, Yuval Noah Harari's new book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And in it, he talks a lot about, you know, his, his projections for the emerging human relationship with AI. And uh, I, I agree with Paul. I think it's going to be so convenient to turn over all sorts of stuff to AI, stuff that only kind of gets done like half-assed now and will be really, really well served by AI. For example, every morning I get up, you know, I have a routine. Uh, I weigh myself, you know, after the first morning pee and before I put on any clothing. So I'm empty and naked. And then I, I write down... Uh, what my weight is. Uh, last year I was writing it in a day planner. This year I'm writing it on a, a desktop 
you know, desk calendar. Um, but it would be, I know that some people, you know, they have a phone and a scale that can talk to each other and software that automatically records that, that data for them. They don't have to write it down. They don't have to enter it into a, an app or something. AI does it for them or whatever you want to call it. If you don't want to call it AI, that's fine. I think, you know, the reason I don't have such a scale is because I, at this point, it's not worth the expense to me. But that expense is going to keep coming down and more and more of our daily objects are going to be talking with our, you know, our primary devices, be it our phone, our computer, some disembodied AI assistant that lives in the cloud. Uh, there, there are central or centralized repositories of data that include a lot of data about us and we generate a lot of data. And right now that data mostly is not accessible to us. It is accessible to the corporations that control the big machines and you know the, the big money data collection services. Uh, but I think as time goes on, more and more of that data will be accessible to us via the intermediary of a personal assistant of some sort. And uh, I very much agree with my friend Paul that these things are going to take on seeming personalities. They may have no subjective experience whatsoever, but they will be sensitive enough to our emotional states and well-programmed in, in responding appropriately that we will not be able to resist the, the overwhelming temptation to anthropomorphize and really come to love these assistants and also get really <laughs> frustrated and angry with them when they, they seem to lack the most basic sorts of common sense. You know, which is totally at odds with their seeming sophistication and ability in other in other realms. Um, I think my friend Bruce thinks that this is is science fiction, and you know, if it does come to pass, it will be uh, basically the the refuge of those who are not really living authentic lives. And you know, maybe there's something to that, but um, I think right now my heart is much closer to the the imagined future of my friend Paul and uh, Yuval Noah Harari. And, you know, some people that um, a few years ago I probably would have dismissed as annoying technophiles. <laughs> so it goes. All right. Thank you very much for checking in today, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.